Uh, she uh, was a student in uh, Sheeran's grad program and a student of mine. You know, when she graduated, uh, my wife, uh, Deb Walker, who was a professor in her own right, came and she wanted to know why I made Sarah do G2 PhD. And it just worked out that way. She got her first PhD of two by working on something called uh, the cell line ontology, which is a project we started with David Stakes. And uh, it's now in use all over the world, I guess. Uh, it's quite uh, remarkable. It's a way, you know, what Sarah was really worried about at the time, as I can remember, is that there were a lot of mistakes with cell culture and tissue culture and these cells that people thought maybe were HeLa cells, or Fiona cell, was really another cell, and it had to be tracked with an ontology. So she got in the business of making them. And uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of an art form. So maybe she'll tell you a little bit about it. And then later on, with uh, Oliver, who her, uh, Oliver is sitting right over there, and Gil and I and Howard Marco, we did a project that was involving. Um, taking very noisy data from adverse event records from the Center for Disease Control and looking at uh, how uh, adverse events from the flu mist, which has came through your sinuses, as you, some of you know, uh, differed from intramuscular uh, influenza vaccine. And uh, looking at the adverse events and then relating them to uh, systems that existed in your body, like the neuromuscular system or the sinus respiratory system and then looking specifically at you know who was subject to what adverse events and how severe they were and saw quite a difference in the amount of Guillain Barre syndrome as I recall in the intermuscular so much so that with Gill and Howard's support with Dr. Fishes at the Center for Disease Control really made quite an impact it was a good thesis um, after she um, graduated from here uh, before she graduated from here, she obtained a uh, bachelor's degree from Thailand. It, uh, how, do you, how, how do you pronounce that name of your university? Mahidon University. I'm glad you said it. Uh, you know, where she uh, got a bachelor's of science in computer science. And she did, we learned last night at dinner that she spent a year in Saskatchewan as a visiting student while she was uh, an undergrad. And Froze to death and went back home. <laughs> she was quite a, and, and Saskatchewan was pretty hardcore in computer science. I know that because my students on Africa did quite well in computer science this year. And so after he left, after Sarah left, you know, one thing I should say was she was a Fulbright scholar, you know, that she came here as a Fulbright scholar and entered the master's program. And, uh, you know, uh, and at that point, the rumor was that there were no bioinformaticians in all of Thailand, and she wanted to be the first one. So that's why she came here to our new grad program. But she did so well as a master's student, they admitted her into the PhD program, and she did very well. And then uh, uh, caught the attention of the Food and Drug Administration, and uh, you know, uh, joined the Food and Drug Administration as a staff uh, postdoc and a staff scientist. And uh, she obtained the Presidential Trainee Award at the American Society for Clinical Pharmacology and Therapeutics annual meeting. I remember for that one paper that we worked on with Daryl Abernathy, who was your precept from an advisor there at the Food and Drug Administration, who ran the, um, the safety uh, branch of the, uh, of the uh, agency. Uh, after uh, being a postdoc there for, what, three years? Almost three almost years. Almost three years. Uh, she uh, left and uh, always the intrepid one, uh, moved to England and uh, joined uh, the group that is overseeing a lot of the resources that bioinformaticians use every day at the um, European Bioinformatics Institute, EBI, which is just near Cambridge, England, and in Hinkston there, I think. And uh, she's been working there for now, what, three, three years? years? Three years. And is rising up the ranks and is one of the lead ontologists and has been involved in several projects that she's going to tell you about. So I think one of the projects you're going to tell us about is probably maybe the Cytotox project that you're working on with the Food and Drug Administration. Pretty tough, yeah. And then the, um, the, the FDA project that you're working on with the, the EBI or something yeah. like that. So I think what we're going to find out is, is for folks like Marcy and Oliver are sitting in the front row here. 
hard hearing oncologist. I think one of the things I would like for all the students in the room is, you know, it'll make us happy if you can answer the question, what is an ontology and why is it important? And so without, it's just wonderful to have you back, Sarah. And, uh, you know, we're really looking forward to seeing what you've been doing since you've left here. And we're very proud of uh, what you've been doing that we can see and now we want to learn the details. So thanks for coming back and kicking off our seminar series for this uh, fall term. Thank you, Brian, for the very kind introduction. So 10 years ago, I was in the audience here, listening to people like Trey Edaker, Peter Sorker, Peter Karp. At that time, I wasn't aware of how big of a deal that was. So today, facing the other way, being in the same series, it's my honor, so thank you. Um, being a student in those chairs, I know that the only thing that would get people to come here outside cookies is a catchy title. And I do mean every word of it, that having relationship is a complicated thing. Everyone can relate to that. <laughs> and um, so I'm going to give you a, a five minute version of what took me 10 years to learn of what ontology is in the ontology 101 here. So before you came into this room, I believe that most of the people here probably have heard of the only ontology that is very, very famous and probably the oldest ontology, the gene ontology. So everyone here has heard of that. Um, do you know how ontology actually operates? Some of you nodding. Um, so yeah, ontology 101, subclass of, is the most primitive, most direct, simple relationship that you can see as a parent-child relationship inside ontology. That was my first lesson learned about ontology. So how is that different from other classification systems that Point two, point three, that I'm going to mention in the next few slides. In this screenshot, everything is called thing. That is a protege ontology editor developed at Stanford, part of the NCBO initiative um, many, many years ago. Um, everything is a thing. And the parent-child relationship comes in as you have a child stemming out of a parent, and it gets more and more specific. So you can have. Having a relationship is a complicated thing. A complicated thing is a thing. So I do mean every word of it when I when I put out that slide, that title in the in the title slide. So that lesson one. Lesson two. This is where ontology gets interesting. You can have further information of a parent-child relationship. One um, one pair of relationship can also be in a different ont ontology relationship with another term. What do I mean by that? So this is a cell line example. It, it's not very easy to understand ontology, so I put a lot of example on here. A cell line can be defined as an entity that derives from another cell type, and the cell type being part of um, an anatomy part. That anatomy part is part of an organism, and that organism can be the bearer of some specific disease. We see a lot of the cancer cell lines. And a cell line can also be classified as um, mouse cell line. Or it can be classified as a specific cell type cell line. Right. So by having cell line derived from the cell and part of some organism part in a human or some other organism, that's the example that I give in BJA BK3 cell lines here. Why is it important that we have this information about cell lines? Um, in ontology, when you run a reasoner, we try to teach the data that it can reason within itself, making the logical thinking, connecting one cell line to certain parts of organism or cell type. We can have a parent, another parent, because right now, a cell line is just a shard of the class cell line. But what if you want to find a cell line that is a class of some B cell cell line grouping? It can be done because in that B cell derived cell line grouping that you don't see um, having any children in the normal view of it suddenly becomes the parent of a lot of cell lines that has that attribute of B cell being part of some developmental stage and part of some organism. This is the secondary classification that you don't see in other system of classification. Other classification that you see, you see the one dimension of it. 
you see parent child. Now you can have one term having multiple parents without having the duplicate definition of it. You just define it once. And then depending on the different views that you flip between the asserted classification or the recent classification of it. So that lesson two of ontology that probably took me seven years. Lesson three. It is a lot easier to define concrete concepts, not so much an abstract concept. So when you when you have anatomy, it's very easy to define that a finger is part of your hand, your hand is part of your arm, your left arm is an arm, and you can also have the right arm. That's very straightforward. But when you start coming into the biomedical field, you start seeing things like phenotypes, diseases, and to most clinicians, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. And then that's been my challenge, too, to tell them that, no, it's not the same. You cannot have phenotypes having the same definitions as disease. So another example here to show this example that it's not very straightforward to, de to define an abstract concept is how many ways can you, can you define cardiomyocytes? Cardiomyocytes, I'm sorry. So this is a view from disease ontology. So an example from so disease ontology is very specific to disease. And they define um, cardiomyopathy as a subclass of myopathy, which turns out to be a muscular system disease. Why isn't it a cardiovascular disease? It's a cardiomyopathy, right? You might ask that. Um, and they have they they have another another subparent called the heart disease. So you can actually have two parents defining cardiomyopathy in disease oncology. The reason I'm asking you. How many ways can you define cardiomyopathy is now that when you look at another disease in EFO, experimental factor ontology, cardiomyopathy, we describe it as cardiovascular disease, but um, with the different attributes, which is OK. Um, the way you build ontologies, you build ontologies based on what you need. So the same term can look different in different ontologies because it's used in different contexts. Ontology of adverse event also has cardiomyopathy, but the context is different here. You, you can only have adverse event triggered by some medical intervention. So in ontology definitions, the cardiomyopathy inside ontology of adverse events look a bit different because now it becomes a process that is triggered by another process. In the previous two examples, cardiomyopathy was just a disposition. It's just some gibberish in ontology language that just tells you that it doesn't go on over the time. But when you define something as a process, it goes on and it has the input and it has the output. So that's a process. So these are the three examples of cardiomyopathy that look totally different in different ontologies. <laughs> So that's probably what yep, everyone here deserves the credit for that. <laughs> so I want you to take credit for it as the brain. Because that took a while to get off the ground. It took so many years. I, I never published a paper. It took so long to publish like that. Because it got grilled because of the adverse event of um, some, some controversial uh, discussion on the side effects of the flu vaccine. And yeah, I was I was. I was the lead on, on developing that ontology of event. Anyway, another cardiomyopathy is in human phenotype ontology. And this is interesting because in this ontology, cardiomyopathy is not a disease. It's actually an abnormality in your body as a phenotype. Not going into the details because I have a lot more to talk about ontology. So I've shown you examples of specific ontologies. I've mentioned gene ontology. I've mentioned disease ontology phenotype ontology, cell line ontology. In real world, you probably ask a, a simple question like, tell me everything you need to know about CP53. That's probably back in biology AP, where you ask that simple of a question. In real world, you ask these questions. What bio, bio, biological mechanism gets triggered when you, when you, when you receive uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that lead to cardiotoxicity side effects? And when you think about these kind of questions, it goes into so many domains of knowledge that you have to draw in and, and, and try to analyze for what the answer is. 
And the other question is, um, what genetic molecular cell evidence do we have to link disease to target? So you go you go across the spectrum again in, in, in this kind of question. So but the two examples I'm giving here, I'm going to go into tell, to details in a little bit. But before I go there, I just told you that because you, you, you're trying to connect so many different things together, and that's the reality. The reality is you have a universe here, a box, containing a cat, a dog, a rat, an orange, a mango, a finger, and um, Tylenol, acetaminophen. If you know how these things relate to each other, congratulations, you probably have a cat. <laughs> this is what happens here. You can put relationships between the unrelated things, but that's how reality works. I don't know about other people's cat, but in my reality, in my universe, my cat likes to sniff fingers, it likes mango, it hates oranges, it fights a dog, not always loose, um, and it will share his rats. It will always sniff finger. That's, that's, I guarantee you, 100% of the time, you see a stranger cat, you stick out your finger, they will come sniffing your finger. And acetaminophen will kill the cat. So this is how the seemingly unrelated reality tends to relate. How do we represent that with ontologies? So you see, there are things, and if you remember the theme of thing, everything in ontology is a thing. You have animal, you have plant, you have chemical compounds. And then in the system of animal, you have rat, cat, and a dog, and human. Why human? Because a finger is part of human. So that's how you put the relationship back into the loop. Then you have plant, which is defined by plant ontology. Again, the, the NCBI taxon always also have plant. Um, then you have relationship that mouse is an animal, dog is an animal, cat is an animal, human is an animal, finger is part of human. Or you have cat chases mouse, cat fights dog, cat will sniff finger, acetaminophen kills the cat. Cat likes mango, cat dislikes oranges. Um, so that's the ontology of cats and things. And this is another layer of ontology. It's called the application ontology. Oh, by the way, that is what it looks like in the real ontology of the NCBI taxonomy. How do we link different types of data together? Um, I mentioned the, the specific domain ontologies. The example that you've just seen just now is an example of how different ontologies are put together to create another layer of ontology called the application ontology. And I do that with ES or the experimental factor ontology. What happens here is we borrow the terms from each domain specific ontologies, be it the cell type ontology, anatomy, Uberon ontology, gene ontology, disease ontology, phenotype ontology. We just take those terms, borrow them from different ontologies. How? Ah, OK. So the web ontology language is um, a W3C standard um, that is used to, to, and, uh, to, to generate an ontology. So historically, it started all the biomedical ontologies historically started being a text file, a flat text file called OBO, Open Biomedical Ontologies. Then, then we started to get more computational, and then we realized that a text file wasn't enough. We need something like a complex XML to, to capture all the, um, the different logics inside the ontologies. So with R, you, you have more expressivity with, with your data. Um, and that's a W3C standard. So it's open source, and then you, 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 get, you get widely supported by the community as well. So coming back to this, or this is just a summarized page that I can take chemical compounds from KB ontology, human phenotype from um, human phenotype ontology, cell type from cell ontology, cell lines, which also uh, interoperate with the cell type ontology, Uberon anatomy, and gene ontology, merge them together, link them together. But the linkages of these different ontologies into one application ontologies is the value added to this. And this is also the list of things that uh, I use mostly in ESO. And it's called the domain specific ontology. It's called the application ontology. Just a summary of what I've just said in the few slides. This is the heart of it. The text, the black text that you see on either side of this, 
can be represented by the different domain ontology, be it the cell ontology, gene ontology, cell line ontology, anatomy ontology. But then we can link the cell line ontology to cell type ontology through the relationship in, in the blue text here. The blue text here is the value added that the upper level application ontology adds to the borrowed term from the different domain specific ontology. And I'm going to show you why this is important. If I give you an example, you, you probably get a little lost here if I say that cell line is the bearer of disease that derived from cell type, part of animal part, and part of organism here. Until I do this, and that the picture starts to get clear that by putting all the arrows here, you're putting the relationship between the different ontologies. So each of the images that you see here can be represented with the domain-specific ontologies. Building the bridge between different ontologies, there is the common task in the application ontology. So I'd like to make sure that now everyone is clear on what domain-specific ontology is and what application ontology is, okay? With the question like what genetic molecular cellular evidence do we have that links disease to target? Now we're stepping into the, the, the motivation of why one would need an uh, application ontology. This is data that we work with in answering that kind of question. We're working with animal models, toxicology, chemical compounds, ENCODE, we do use ENCODE project at the open targets. This is the case, the use case of our open targets at opentargets.org. Um, open targets use these information, all the resources available at um, the EDI, Sanger Institute, GSK and Biogen um, with, the, with, with the drive that drugs are indeed very expensive and when it fails and if it fails late, it costs even more. So we have to try to answer and find out the evidence of a drug um, disease target association to, to scan and, and screen through all the information that we have of what targets should we invest in. And that's why we get funded by GSK and Biogen to do this, this, this task. Um, so answering that question, uh, we draw in all the information of all the possible resources that bioinformatics students might have heard of, maybe ENCODE, Reactome, GWAS catalog, cosmic um, cancer mutations, ensemble genes, gene expression at last, and a lot more, Uniprot and all of that. Um, how do we use this data? Before I go there, um, just a quick summarized page of the kind of question that can be answered with this open target platform. It looks clean and simple. You can get the information about this example of PDE4D target. You can filter it by the different biological uh, pathways. You can have the classification of different clusters of diseases based on the anatomical system or the um, or the gene process, the gene, gene ontology biological process. And everything here, um, it looks clean, but to a novice, you probably think this is easy. It's not. It integrates so much data in it. So the, if, if I dig deeper, this is just a run through of if I type in PD4D, in that bigger picture, if I zoom in on one of the, one of the bubbles here, you can actually see the different types of um, evidence that goes in there. Uh, being, um, I think this one is the chemical compound from Kimbells. I encourage you to just go to open targets.org and, and, and play with it. And if you search by a disease name, what you get is a list of targets. So if you search by target, you get a list of disease. If you, get, if you search by disease, you get a list of targets. Um, um, at the top here, you see that each column goes by the different data types that we use at OpenTargets.org. So genetic associations that GWAS catalog and CLINVAR in the European Variation Archive. Somatic mutations come in from cosmic um, cancer mutations. Drugs come in from Kimbells and KB. Affected pathways come in from Reactome. Text mining comes from Europe PMC. Uh, Animal models come from the wet lab uh, data that we have from Sanger Institute. Um, each of the boxes here, the light blue and the deeper blue, indicates the stronger 
scoring in the deeper blue and weaker scoring in the lighter blue. And each type of data, when it gets a scored, um, I, I'd like to credit the, the, the bill statistician in our group that um, a lot of thoughts has gone into this because when you think about it, sleep traits analysis, it, they are not there, so it's zero and one. When you look at expression data, it's p-value. When you look at um, text mining, for example, it's pf, idf, scoring, and, and normalizing all this score together to, to calculate for the overall scoring was a very difficult task, and I cannot go into details about that, but I'd like to acknowledge them for that. He was catalog. Right down along here. So there's there's a tight connection of that international sea bottom research. Yep, we are we are very fortunate that um EBI and SGRI and NIH we, we work pretty closely together. So consortium like the gene ontology or um G was catalog, we do have the the meeting between the two sides of, of the Atlantic pretty often on a regular basis. Um, and I forgot to mention that I, I, I am part of the team called the Sample Phenotype and Ontology Team, as SPOT, um, led by Helen Parkinson. And in SPOT, gene ontology, experimental factor ontology, any ontology thing at the EBI go through our group. And gene yep, we have an office for gene ontology as well. Um, so, so, so this is another good example too. Gene ontology is is the best known example of the domain specific ontology that surrounds genes and gene products. EFO is the application ontologies that mandates all the data integration in the back end of all the EBI databases resources. Um, in the next slide, you'll see. So, um, this is just an example of how when you click on a link, it goes straight to the original source, and this one is coming in from GWAS catalog. If we click on GWAS catalog link, it pulls up the original record from the GWAS catalog database. Um, and all these different kinds of data gets integrated and it's made possible only because all the data is mapped to EFO. So before we started open targets, in the in the far right, right, left of this slide here, you see that. At the beginning, a few databases were annotated to different ontologies. For example, Reactome was annotated to disease ontology. Um, European Variation Archive, Quinva, was annotated to OMIM, Orphanet, Nomad, um, Genetic Alliance, and Human Genotype Ontology. Kim Bell was annotated to APC classification, which is a drug classification. Um, cosmic cancer mutation was mapped to NCID and their own control vocabulary. Phenodyme at Sanger Institute was mapped to mammalian phenotype ontology and human phenotype ontology. So you cannot really integrate and build any connections between all these different data because there are different ontologies from different domain specific ontologies and that's why we need ontology like EF or that pulls in, consumes, subsumes in all these specific terms from different compatible ontologies because there are things that weren't compatible in, in the ontology world, like SNOMED or I, NCI thesaurus. These are vocabularies, but they're not ontologies. So we had to work to consolidate those differences into EFO. And right at this moment, after Open Targets was launched, everything is annotated to EFO. And thanks, I have to acknowledge the curators at the EBI. EBI highly valued the human curated data set. So all the data here are mapped to to, depending on the team, I'm aware that there are six in Atlas. Um, there are another five or six in Uniprod. Um, so altogether, like each specific data providers, they have their own experts in house. So um, KB, they have four, actually seven. They hired more. Um, uh, the 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 biochemist, the bio biochem informatics people to curate and generate the new terms for for KB for this project and EFO borrow the terms from KB and put the relationship in for this project. Um, and this is just an example of how, how the GWAS catalog curator who sits two desks away from me um, 
that's all the EFO term curation for Jewel's catalog, because Jewel's catalog needs trade names, and trade names are necessarily disease terms. So we, we have the workflow that go, go through the adding terms, modifying terms, and then listing all terms so that when you go to Jewel's catalog website, you can see the, the beautiful visualization of the colorful dots that is grouped by the different trade and SNPs. Um, and this is um, the open targets data release cycle. We're looking at the next release of open targets in October, so next month. Um, so at the top, you see that it all starts with EFO release, and that's how important the control vocabularies and ontology plays part in big and large scale data integration. Then it goes through data source curation and mining, the step that I've just mentioned here. It goes through the pipeline analysis before it gets mapped between the, the two components, the drugs, you know, the disease target associ association through the different kinds of evidence here. Now, I've just given you an example of how a really, really, really big data integration happens. Another kind of information that we need to mind to answer um, question like, what biological mechanism explain the occurrence of cardiotoxic side effects in tyrosine kinase inhibitors, cancer patients? Again, we go. I was hired to do that at the FDA. <laughs> it turned out to be an awesome project. <laughs> Yep. So what, what they learned is that it does cure cancer in a way. But they noticed that after a while, um, it's, so the patient starts having heart failure. And, and what causes that? And the, the signal that comes up is it's too high to be coincident. Um, and, and, and it has so many factors into it. The cardiologist uh, said this is a severe uh, heart phenotype. And then the oncologist said, it doesn't matter if we don't treat the patients, the patient is going to die anyway. So, so that, that's, a, that's a very fun part of it. Yeah, so, so they want to understand, they don't really know how, how, how TKI um, as the cancer treatment can cause the cardiotoxicity side effect. But if they understand that, then um, maybe they can start treating the patient with the cardio, uh, cardiotoxic treatment at the same time or when we know that this is where it kicks in. So that's the whole drive um, behind this diagram too. So. Motivation is that we know that TKIs the, and monoclonal antibodies molecules sort of cure cancer. We don't know how it causes cardiac adverse events. So on your left here is, um, is the kinase domain where um, this is the cardiogenesis pathway for um, chronic myelite leukemia studied by Shane and all. In, uh, in Force and Thomas Force, and it turns out to be a very respectable paper in in a reference paper in the whole um, cancer tox cardiotoxicity study. So when ABEL BCR domain gets activated, it triggers these three pathways: that 5 RAF, CI3 kinase, that down regulates apoptosis, and that the that is the, the the pro-survival pathways, and that leads to cancer. Here, I had put in the example of imatinib, which is um, um, an inhibitor, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, that, that actually triggers also at the same time, it inhibits ABEL and, and ARC complex, which leads to ER stress, and then it goes down the, it tries to restore the equilibrium inside your cells. And then, depending on which path it took, it can restore uh, the equilibrium and the apoptosis and cell death can, can begin again. Or uh, when too many cells have died because of the ER stress and causing the protein misfolding, then the cell survival gets triggered. But what they don't, nobody really understands at this point is how, how imagine it blocking TDGR, TDGFR 
going where and the cerebrinol that blocks the uh, stress. What what how 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 does that work? Nobody really understands that. And and in this project, we're hoping that understanding some kind of mechanism in here will help answer the um, the cardiotoxicity um, side effects of the drugs. And this is the tyrosine kinase inhibitors and mo uh, mo monoclonal antibodies general mechanism of how it blocks tyrosine kinase. Um, so MAP interfere with lichen binding. So so it cannot get activated. The TKIs, the NIPs, the inhibitors, um, block the binding of ATP. So again, the pathways get deactivated. But when you treat cancer, this is another dimension of complexity. When you treat cancer, the patients also receive cocktails of drugs, right? So now we're adding a very complex disease. Cancer is a very complex disease with complex phenotype and then cocktails of drugs. How do you know for sure which drug causes what in your system? So in this example, we know that um, there's a proposed mechanism that sunitinib also interacts with sorafenib because they are taken as a cocktail in the cancer patient as well. And it hits both endothelial cells and cardiomyocytes. Both, um, both cells, when it goes down to the pathways here results in compensated high hypertrophy of the heart. And again, another source of, of cardiotoxic adverse event, because when your heart gets enlarged, then, then it's not very functional, and then you get heart failure. So it, this was taken. This is why I was hired at the SDA. Dr. Dara Ibernethi came up with this vision of systems pharmacology, the understanding, the, 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 the connection between each layers from the very bottom up all the way to the population level will give you an insight to um, cancer cardiotoxicity. And he believes that ontologies can link all these different data together. So thinking back to open target, it's along the same thinking, where you are using multiple ontologies for different data to generate an integration pipeline to answer a specific question, a complex question. So we came up with this diagram that when you look at it in modules, modular models, you can have signal dictation detection models, you can have preclinical, clinical data analysis module, you can have chemical structure analysis, you can have non-clinical um, toxicology uh, coming in from the experimental part of the picture. But at the end of the day, everything in bioinformatics is the hypothesis generator. You also you still need the, the the knowledge expert to analyze and verify your um, your results. Um, this is an example of how bioinformatics can can expand your network knowledge. Um, we did so the in in um, Forrest, Thomas Forrest and Chen studies. We came up with the gene network of the proposed cardiotoxicity in, in TI, T, TKI recipients. But then we did the text mining with ontology that I'm not going to go into details with um, another colleague. Uh, we came up with JAK stat TNF interleukin 1. Oh, JAK stat interleukin 1 TNF was the, was, was the human curated part that we added in. All the green boxes that you see here are the genes that we could mine from this ontology enhanced text mining. The yellow boxes that you see here is the pathway proposed by Thomas Force. From that previous picture comes this diagram. The different colors here represent the different ontologies. And again, we're building the bridge between different ontologies through, an, through a relationship. How do we do that? So that was, um, we had the Transmart. In instance at the FDA, and we store our data in different folders like that, but they're not very ontology um, compatible. So here's what happened with CRF train of thought. I tried to break it down to grouping of related terms, and each grouping here, I, I know that I can represent them with the different domain ontologies listed in the table, and then I can generate um, 
a, a subset of EFO terms that can represent the data in pretty talk project. So again, same line of thinking of integrating all the data. In the EFO, there is no adverse event component in it when you look at the EFO, um, the original EFO. But we can assert in, we can insert a chunk of ontology of adverse event inside this EFO version of Predict Talk because it follows the same parent um, guideline that we have in the oval foundry of how you share the components. If you follow the, the tree traverse up the tree, you see that adverse event is categorized as a pathological bodily process, which is a process. When you look at EF for predict talks on the right hand side, you also have a process. And if you look into the ontology file, both process in the two sides here, they refer to the same common theme in the oboe foundry. And that's how you can plug in the adverse event module into this um, newly generated EFO predict talk. In summary, the benefit of application ontologies that I can summarize for you here, you can use the application ontology like EFO to do the smart searching that's taken from Atlas and Microarray Express screenshot, data analysis here that's taken from the gene ontology analysis tool, data integration that's open target example and data visualization like I mentioned that you can have the beautiful colorful groupings here every each each and every dot of the colorful dots here the, the classified by EFO terms um, this is just a, a slide that from everything that I've mentioned thus far it is it is not me doing all the manual work. We've developed the tools to help you annotate your terms into an ontology terms. We have the ontology lookup service OLS at the EBI. We have Zuma, which try which takes your text, try to map your text into the compatible ontology terms. And when you don't find the ontology terms to be mapped to your data, we also accept um, like an Excel spreadsheet file that the expert fill in with their expert domain knowledge, like disease or cell line or whatever. And then I take that spreadsheet and run it through the tool called WebBlus here. And WebBlus would just crank up the ontology classes for me. And my job is to make sure that the newly generated classes fall into the right place in the classification with the right logic reasoning inside the ontology. So before I end here, these are the people that I'd like to thank, other than everyone here in this room. Um, it's, it's a very big project. And Dr. Melissa Handel, another big name in Bioontology Society, said on two separate occasions that I have heard at the BioCuration meeting in Geneva this year and the BioCreative meeting in Oregon just a few months ago that if the ontologists do our job right, the users may never know that we exist, but they will notice when we don't exist, when you don't get the when you don't get the result, when you do the query. Another comment on that to the students here, I'd like to leave a few words for you. Find your role model, listen to him, follow him, because I did, and it I went by because of that. Um, he came, Dr. Brian Avey, always coming to 527 mentioning that you should be reading this book. And one of the books that he said was uh, that I should read was The Age of the Spiritual Machines. It turned out to be amazing. You should read that. Came to visit him again two weeks ago. He did give me a, a homework. So Detroit is my own hometown. It's a very interesting book. Because um, now I want to see the brunette Venus. I'm not going to tell you who she is. You just have to read this book or it tells me the story of this Detroit businessman who wants to reduce the price of the of the car body, the auto body that he built because he was making too much profit. By the way, he was the first man who ever built the four-door auto body or GM. No, that wasn't why I want to mention this book at all. This book was first published in 1946. And this is a reprint of it. And on the on, on, on the first very first page, it actually tells you how it's published, how it's reprinted. You might think I'm crazy, right? 
Um, it actually was from a very rare book, and that's very rare old book written by Mr. Malcolm Wallace Dingers. How they reprinted this book, they used the optical scanning, which turns out to give you a lot of false positives because the book was old and rare. It tries to use some program, some computer algorithm to correct those mistakes and typos scanned by this optimal scanning method. At the end of the day, human has to read it and still fix one of those little mistypes that, that, that the, the computer program generated. Lesson learned, same thing with the bioinformatics. Doesn't matter how awesome your program is, you will still need the human to do all the final variables. Thank you. I have to give this back to you. <laughs> uh, how about some questions for Sir? I guess I, 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 you know, so are you going to walk out of here and tell us what the ontology is at this point? I did tell you. I did. The first five, ten minutes, yeah. you know, wasn't. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 how you taught me to. You don't directly give me what it is. You actually made me think a lot of what it is. And I hope I did try to imitate the same process here. I think for me one of the things that I've learned in this talk is how I'm underlying that. You know, I I guess I learned when I worked in the creation we spent a lot of time with Dr. Woodman and all the things that went on. I, I do remember, you know, I've seen it in Frank and some Bill Sidney, you know, I mean, we used to go into the NLM, Mr. Hill Center, years ago, you know, you'd see 200 curators in there uh, in the old days of pop up before any machine learning. It was all hand curation for that, and there were a lot of guys working at home. So, you know, at this point, like the book, I mean, uh, you know, things are done digitally now, so is there some kind of check? What you know? What, what is the life of a curator and an ontologist look like? Well, so again, um, I have to rephrase that. That if the ontologists and the curators do our job right, people will never know that we exist. But you are actually missed greatly if you don't exist, because suddenly when you go to a large database trying to query for something, it will take you three years before you get any results back because you cannot do. Um, the query the, the, the old way anymore. You cannot do the cross joins between different Oracle SQL databases and tables. And, and now everything is in the cloud. So it, it's not very convenient to do all the Spark, uh, to do all the SQL query over Oracle servers in multiple locations. Now everything is in the Sparkle query, and that is a SQL like um, queries that is done because everything is. On the different sites in the cloud, get annotated to a reference URI, okay. the identifiers for different so, ontology. Well, let's see if I can think, and you guys can help with this. But you know, the idea of a data lake would be that you put all your data in there, and it's unformatted, and it's kind of raw data, and then the schema is written when you uh, pull it out of the lake. But uh, you know, the data warehouse or the data mart. Would be where the schemas are made up ahead of time, and then you know it's kind of like you're running a knowledge base uphill. It's my guess that you're creating, uh, you know, you're using the, uh, you, you, you're building the ontologies, but then you know moving the data into elements of the ontology in a similar fashion that you might do in a data, in, you know, in a data warehouse scheme, so that when you query, you query against the knowledge base. So it's much different than you would with Google, where you get a statistical classifier that weights the terms up into the query. It seems to me that what you're trying to do is encode the knowledge into a knowledge yep. base and, uh, and, and actually uh, supply the elements of the information and data onto the skeleton of the ontology, uh, which would be more of a, uh, more of a data warehouse uh, than a data lake. I'm looking at you, Mark. Yeah, I'm, not sure I would, I'm not sure I would discuss it that way. Yeah. 
the, you know, I think the thing that you talked about was normalizing all of these different data sources to a referential ontology. And I think that's the key that's needed, whether you're doing a warehouse or a data lake or, um, you know, a lot of the big data folks don't believe in either approach, right? <laughs> you know? I mean, if you've got some Well, you know, ideas. I was trying to bring it into the biomedical setting yeah. where we tend to go to those extremes. Right. But up big data, it's more like the Google approach. Yeah, well, some of it is, right, but I think yeah. that's, you know, I think some people think that's going to hit a wall as well without ontology. So, yeah. Um, yeah. in my recent experience, um, I think as, as we're moving towards more of the clinical data, EHR, mm -hmm. um, this is the task that is only realized when you sit at the data and you realize there's no way you can use this data. And that comes in late, very late. And and so when you when you try to plan, when you write a grant, you try to plan on a proposal, you don't see that it doesn't get into the proposal until the proposal gets a, gets gets approved and then you get the money and suddenly you have to to, to do it and now you have to submit your supplement. Well that's what I wanted to say. The three of us, if I, I know the time's almost up, but next on the nineteenth, Monday the nineteenth, uh, the three of us are involved in a, a UO one that's kicking off. Uh, another investigator coming that's looking at a metadata ontology for informed consent for biorepositories oh, specifically. Good. And I'll send you the notice, and it might be of interest to people in this space because it's not the real stuff, it's the abstract concepts it can be. Yeah, it's, quite it's a an challenge. abstract concept. So there, there, there are many examples in, in that realm, and, and um, the, the bad news is it didn't get realized until it's very late in the process. The good news is they actually realize it when they have to realize it. Okay. More questions for um, I actually would encourage the students to ask. There's no yeah, that no, sure. stupid questions or stupid answers. So first, uh, I suppose all gene ontology are created when someone develop experiments to find a new function, and that is not explained in the previous ontology. But There's then sorry. The, the so no. I. Uh, I don't know how new GO terms are created, but I guess it will only be created if a new previously uh, uncharacterized function is found by valid experiment. So However, in fact, when I look at the Unipro GO, GOA database, there are some GO that are only annotated to IEA evidence. There's no web lab experiments to show what protein we find. So there, there are two parts in this. So gene ontology and gene ontology annotation, they're two separate offices. They're related. Um, so the gene ontology part of it, if I may say, they're um, knowledge-driven part of the ontology. GOA, gene, an gene ontology annotation, is another team where um, you can you can get submission. There's a portal to do that online where you make the request that I have this experiment and it should be annotated and it should be added into the gene ontology that way. So there are two ways to submit information to that. Um, both both teams actually would take. There are curators in both teams. Both GO and GOA they make up the, the gene ontology consortium, which has the, the collaborators both in America and on the European side. Yeah. Um, I can't tell you in details how they do that, but I can redirect you to the right person to ask that question, if that helps. And your second question? Um, my second question is, uh, on average, how soon we will, uh, pub we will publish relevant experimental paper become a new GO annotation? Because well, in some times I found the wet lab experiments that lead to the annotation is how many years after the annotation. Ooh, I, okay, I will try to address this question um, in, a in, in, in a sensible way. Uh, because people don't notice that curators exist. Sometimes we don't get funded, and that's probably where we get the delay in annotations. Some other times, um, they have they have their own system of, of distributing tasks. It's not one team at the EBI. There's also teams in California, teams somewhere else in America. 
uh, and it goes different places. It's like you, you get you get this portion, you get this portion, you get this portion of the quiz. So I cannot answer which team is going to put in the annotation faster than the other team. Um, there are also the case where um, Dean D DOA, Dean, anno Dean Ontology Annotations, started working on a few years ago on the annotation of the Dean functions. But Dean Ontology exists a lot longer than that. So uh, they started working on, at this, on DOA at this point, and sometimes they have to go back retro retro retrospectively um, and annotate the data from many years ago. So that could also be the case. Um, so in your scenario of your question, there can be any of these cases that I've just described. That's no stupid question, but I will give you stupid answer maybe. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little about the some of the challenges you might have encountered between the non-realism-based ontologies and ones that were essentially built along obo foundry principles. How do I answer this question without upsetting too many people who might be listening? <laughs> um, so there are people who call their ontologies ontologies, and I don't believe that they're good ontologies. And there are the Obo Foundry people who, who believe strongly in the shared common elements of building ontologies. There's also the hybrid between the two parties called EFO, me, where EFO is not Obo Foundry because we don't define our domain. We just borrow terms from Obo Foundry. Um, essentially, in the bio-ontology world, um, on, a good ontology follows certain rules. And we tend to disregard the rest of ontologies as non-ontologies. <laughs> um, their vocabulary, ontol vocabulary, it gets used a lot. Like ICD-9, ICD-10, SNOMED. Um, there's also framework like CDISC and HL7, who, um, in my experience, they have tried to build HL7 ontologies, and, and they can only cry. Um, but there's, there's a common ground. because. On, on the one way, on, on, on the one hand, these are the vocabularies that get used heavily in the other part, the important part like ESR, SNOMED, ICD, CDISC, SL7, MEDRA terms. These are heavily used in the clinical domain, which there, is, there was a big disconnection in the middle between that side of the world and the ontology side of the world. And that's, that's where I come in. That's where I start building cross-referencing between vocabularies like MEDRA into ontology of adverse events, or when I look at the HL7 and see this framework and try to identify which which element inside the HL7 framework or see this framework that can be replaced with specific domain ontology. There, there's still work to do, and as a matter of fact, when I go back next month, there will be another see this HL7 meeting with the ontology group at the EBI to resolve this. So there's, there's a merging. This is, it's no longer very disconnected anymore because now as, as, we, as the work gets smaller and smaller and now that the, the, clinic, the clinical part start to realize that data are too messy, they start listening to us and at the same time we start learning that actually there's some biological and clinical relevance that, that we need to listen to how they use the data. And then we can start building the data-driven ontology and not so much the knowledge-driven ontology. And because I'm very good at talking to people, that's why I'm put here <laughs> to do the job. Um, I hate going back to gene ontology because I know you sound like the, the big one everybody knows. But is there any way at, at these uh, symposia or consortia level that you guys protect against uh, terminal ontology terms or, or terms that are informative but singletons applying to only one specific experiment? I don't believe there's such restriction on that. Um, so it took me 10 years to do ontology, and I tried to give you the five-minute version of it. So in ontology, um, I briefly mentioned that it's context-specific. So it's very important that when you see terms like cardiomyocyte, you might grab the first thing that you see. But before you do that, you actually need to investigate the context of it, the definition of it. Um, cardiologists and oncologists might not have the same definitions of, of cardiomyopathy or 
MCI people have their own vocabularies that goes into the details of grade, grade one, grade two, grade three, grade four of cardiomyopathy. Different grades have different definitions too. So, so sometimes if you see that the terms, you know that the term exists somewhere, but how come it doesn't get used? It's probably because the expert, when they investigate that term, they actually look deep into the definition and the context of it, and it's it's a process, and not a dissertation. It's a disease, and not a phenotype, and that's that's when the call is made. Because in ear four that I maintain, I know that there are so many disease terms that I create myself, even though it exists in disease ontology, because. The definitions inside the disease ontology doesn't fit the, 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 the use case that I use at open targets. And that, I think, might be most of the times why it doesn't get used. And again, another reason might be people aren't aware that it exists. Thank you very much. It feels really good to be here. There you go. Let me thank all of you for coming, especially the students. We have a very good turnout today, and I'm proud to see you all here. I hope you'll be back on a regular basis. I'm going to learn about new things each week, not just things you already know a lot about. Syria, we're very proud of you. Not only are you a wonderful ambassador for our program and a sterling graduate, but you've shown you can go off on a path of your own choosing. Thank into you. places where you, you know, so often people say, well, Where's the role model to do this or that or the next thing? I was inspired about 40 years ago by a, a prominent professor, chief of medicine at the University of Washington when I was a young fellow. He had a plaque on the wall that said, do not ask what path to follow. Go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. That's I pretty good. I hope I'm doing that. And I think you're doing We need that. more great. ontologist students, so please. You, if good. you have any questions, you can talk to me. And we do take internship at the UBI. So if you have the slight interest in ontologies, email me. Oh, I Yes, I have visited there several times. It's a wonderful <laughs> institution, beautiful environment. It's worth taking her up on this opportunity. Thank you. I forgot to put that up. So. Thank you all.